Chapter Two of Japanese Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Winna Hathaway. Japanese Fairy Tales by Ye Theodora Osaki. Chapter Two, The Tonkot Sparrow. Long, long ago in Japan. There lived an old man and his wife. The old man was a good, kind-hearted, hard-working old fellow, but his wife was a regular crosspatch, who spoiled the happiness of her home by her scolding tongue. She was always grumbling about something from morning to night. The old man had for a long time ceased to take any notice of her crossness. He was out most of the day at work in the fields, and, as he had no child for his amusement when he came home, he kept a tame sparrow. He loved the little bird just as much as if she had been his child. When he came back at night, after his hard day's work in the open air, it was his only pleasure to pet the sparrow, to talk to her and to teach her little tricks, which she learned very quickly. The old man would open her cage and let her fly about the room, and they would play together. Then, when supper-time came, he always saved some titbits from his meal, with which to feed his little bird. Now one day the old man went out to chop wood in the forest, and the old woman stopped at home to wash clothes. The day before, she had made some starch, and now, when she came to look for it, it was all gone. The bowl which she had filled full yesterday was quite empty. While she was wondering who could have used or stolen the starch, down flew the pet sparrow, and bowing her little feathered head, a trick which she had been taught by her master, the pretty bird chirped and said, "'It is I who have taken the starch. I thought it was some food put out for me in that basin, and I ate it all. If I made a mistake, I beg you to forgive me. Tweet, tweet, tweet!' You see from this, that the sparrow was a truthful bird, and the old woman ought to have been willing to forgive her at once, when she asked her pardon so nicely. But not so. The old woman had never loved the sparrow, and had often quarrelled with her husband for keeping what she called a dirty bird about the house, saying that it only made extra work for her. Now she was only too delighted to have some cause of complaint against a pet. She scolded and even cursed the poor little bird for her bad behavior, and not content with using these harsh and feeling words, in a fit of rage she seized the sparrow, who all this time had spread out her wings and bowed her head before the old woman, to show how sorry she was, and fetched the scissors and cut off the poor little bird's tongue. I suppose you took my starch with that tongue. Now you may see what it is like to go without it. And with these dreadful words she drove the bird away, not caring in the least what might happen to it, and without the smallest pity for its suffering. So unkind was she! The old woman, after she had driven the sparrow away, made some more rice paste, grumbling all the time at the trouble, and after starching all her clothes, spread the things on boards to dry in the sun, instead of ironing them as they do in England. In the evening the old man came home. As usual, on the way back, he looked forward to the time when he should reach his gate and see his pet come flying and chirping to meet him, ruffling out her feathers to show her joy, and at last coming to rest on his shoulder. But to-night the old man was very disappointed, for not even the shadow of his dear sparrow was to be seen. He quickened his steps hastily drew off his straw sandals, and stepped onto the veranda. Still no sparrow was to be seen. He now felt sure that his wife, in one of her cross tempers, had shut the sparrow up in its cage. So he called her and said anxiously, "'Where is Susume-san, Miss Sparrow, to-day?' The old woman pretended not to know at first, and answered, "'Your sparrow? I am sure I don't know.' Now I come to think of it, I haven't seen her all the afternoon. I shouldn't wonder if the ungrateful bird had flown away and left you after all your petting. 
But at last, when the old man gave her no peace, but asked her again and again, insisting that she must know what had happened to his pet, she confessed all. She told him crossly how the sparrow had eaten the rice paste she had specially made for starching her clothes, and how when the sparrow had confessed to what she had done, in great anger she had taken her scissors and cut out her tongue, and how finally she had driven the bird away and forbidden her to return to the house again. Then the old woman showed her husband the sparrow's tongue, saying, "'Here is the tongue I cut off, horrid little bird. Why did it eat all my starch?' "'How could you be so cruel? Oh, how could you be so cruel?' was all that the old man could answer. He was too kind-hearted to punish his shrew of a wife. But he was terribly distressed at what had happened to his poor little sparrow. "'What a dreadful misfortune for my poor Susume-san to lose her tongue,' he said to himself. "'She won't be able to chirp any more, and surely the pain of the cutting of it out in that rough way must have made her ill. Is there nothing to be done?' The old man shed many tears after his cross wife had gone to sleep. While he wiped away the tears with the sleeve of his cotton robe, a bright thought comforted him. He would go and look for the sparrow on the morrow. Having decided this, he was able to go to sleep at last. The next morning he rose early, as soon as ever the day broke, and snatching a hasty breakfast, started out over the hills and through the woods, stopping at every clump of bamboos to cry, "'Where, oh, where does my tongue-cut sparrow stay?' Where, oh, where does my tongue-cut sparrow stay? He never stopped to rest for his noonday meal, and it was far on in the afternoon when he found himself near a large bamboo wood. Bamboo groves are the favorite haunts of sparrows, and there, sure enough, at the edge of the wood, he saw his own dear sparrow waiting to welcome him. He could hardly believe his eyes for joy, and ran forward quickly to greet her. She bowed her little head, and went through a number of the tricks her master had taught her, to show her pleasure at seeing her old friend again. And, wonderful to relate, she could talk as of old. The old man told her how sorry he was for all that had happened, and inquired after her tongue, wondering how she could speak so well without it. Then the sparrow opened her beak and showed him that a new tongue had grown in place of the old one, and begged him not to think any more about the past, for she was quite well now. Then the old man knew that his sparrow was a fairy and no common bird. It would be difficult to exaggerate the old man's rejoicing now. He forgot all his troubles, he forgot even how tired he was, for he had found his lost sparrow and instead of being ill and without a tongue, as he had feared and expected to find her, she was well and happy, and with a new tongue, and without a sign of the ill-treatment she had received from his wife. And above all, she was a fairy. The sparrow asked him to follow her, and flying before him, she led him to a beautiful house in the heart of the bamboo grove. The old man was utterly astonished, when he entered the house to find what a beautiful place it was. It was built of the whitest wood. The soft cream-colored mats which took the place of carpets were the finest he had ever seen, and the cushions that the sparrow brought out for him to sit on were made of the finest silk and crepe. Beautiful vases and lacquer boxes adorned the tokonoma. Footnote, an alcove where precious objects are displayed, of every room. The sparrow led the old man to the place of honor, and then, taking her place at a humble distance, she thanked him with many polite bows for all the kindness he had shown her for many long years. Then the lady sparrow, as we will now call her, introduced all her family to the old man. This done, her daughters, robed in dainty grape gowns, brought in on beautiful old-fashioned trays a feast of all kinds of delicious foods till the old man began to think he must be dreaming. In the middle of the dinner, 
Some of the sparrow's daughters performed a wonderful dance called the Susumi Odori, or the sparrow's dance, to amuse the guest. Never had the old man enjoyed himself so much. The hours flew by too quickly in this lovely spot, with all these fairy sparrows to wait upon him, and to feast him, and to dance before him. But the night came on, and the darkness reminded him that he had a long way to go, and must think about taking his leave and return home. He thanked his kind hostess for her splendid entertainment, and begged her for his sake to forget all she had suffered at the hands of his cross old wife. He told the lady sparrow that it was a great comfort and happiness to him to find her in such a beautiful home, and to know that she wanted for nothing. It was his anxiety to know how she fared, and what had really happened to her, that had led him to seek her. Now he knew that all was well, he could return home with a light heart. If ever she wanted him for anything, she had only to send for him, and he would come at once. The lady sparrow begged him to stay, and rest several days, and enjoy the change. But the old man said he must return to his old wife, who would probably be cross at his not coming home at the usual time, and to his work, and therefore, much as he wished to do so, he could not accept her kind invitation. But now that he knew where the lady's sparrow lived, he would come to see her whenever he had the time. When the lady sparrow saw that she could not persuade the old man to stay longer, she gave an order to some of her servants and they at once brought in two boxes, one large and the other small. These were placed before the old man, and the lady's sparrow asked him to choose whichever he liked for a present, which she wished to give him. The old man could not refuse his kind proposal, and he chose the smaller box, saying, I am now too old and feeble to carry the big and heavy box. As you are so kind as to say that I may take whichever I like, I will choose the small one, which will be easier for me to carry. Then the sparrows all helped him put it on his back, and went to the gate to see him off, bidding him good-bye with many bows, and entreating him to come again whenever he had the time. Thus the old man and his pet sparrows separated quite happily, the sparrow showing not the least ill-will for all the unkindness she had suffered at the hands of the old wife. Indeed, she only felt sorrow for the old man, who had to put up with it all his life. When the old man reached home, he found his wife even crosser than usual, for it was late on in the night, and she had been waiting up for him for a long time. "'Where have you been all this time?' she asked in a big voice. "'Why do you come back so late?' The old man tried to pacify her by showing her the box of presents he had brought back with him, and then he told her of all that had happened to him, and how wonderfully he had been entertained at the sparrow's house. "'Now let us see what is in the box,' said the old man, not giving her time to grumble again. "'You must help me open it.' And they both sat down before the box and opened it. To their utter astonishment they found the box— filled to the brim with gold and silver coins, and many other precious things. The mats of the little cottage fairly glittered as they took out the things one by one, and put them down and handled them over and over again. The old man was overjoyed at the sight of the riches that were now his. Beyond his brightest expectations was the sparrow's gift, which would enable him to give up work, and live in ease and comfort the rest of his days. He said, "'Thanks to my good little sparrow, thanks to my good little sparrow,' many times. But the old woman, after the first moments of surprise and satisfaction, at the sight of the gold and silver were over, could not suppress her greed of her wicked nature. She now began to reproach the old man for not having brought home the big box of presents, for in the innocence of his heart, he had told her how he had refused the large box of presents which the sparrows had offered him, preferring the smaller one because it was light and easy to carry home. "'You silly old man!' said she. "'Why did you not bring the large box? Just think what we have lost. 
You might have had twice as much silver and gold as this. You are certainly an old fool, she screamed, and then went to bed as angry as she could be. The old man now wished that he had said nothing about the big box, but it was too late. The greedy old woman, not contented with the good luck which had so unexpectedly befallen them, and which she so little deserved, made up her mind, if possible, to get more. Early the next morning she got up, and made the old man describe the way to the sparrow's house. When he saw what was in her mind, he tried to keep her from going, but it was useless. She would not listen to one word he said. It is strange that the old woman did not feel ashamed of going to see this sparrow after the cruel way she had treated her in cutting off her tongue in a fit of rage. But her greed to get the big box made her forget everything else. It did not even enter her thoughts that the sparrows might be angry with her, as indeed they were, and might punish her for what she had done. Ever since the lady sparrow had returned home in the sad plight in which they had first found her, weeping and bleeding from the mouth. Her whole family and relations had done little else but speak of the cruelty of the old woman. "'How could she?' they asked each other. "'Inflict such a heavy punishment for such a trifling offence as that of eating some rice paste by mistake.' They all loved the old man who was so kind and good and patient under all his troubles, but the old woman they hated and they determined, if ever they had a chance, to punish her as she deserved. They had not long to wait. After walking for some hours, the old woman had at last found the bamboo grove, which she had made her husband carefully describe, and now she stood before it crying out, "'Where is the tongue sparrow's house? Where is the tongue sparrow's house?' At last she saw the eaves of the house, peeping out from amongst the bamboo foliage. She hastened to the door and knocked loudly. When the servants told the lady sparrow that her old mistress was at the door asking to see her, she was somewhat surprised at the unexpected visit, after all that had taken place, and she wondered not a little at the boldness of the old woman in venturing to come to the house. The lady sparrow, however, was a polite bird, and so she went out to greet the old woman remembering that she had once been her mistress. The old woman intended, however, to waste no time in words. She went right to the point, without the least shame, and said, "'You need not trouble to entertain me as you did my old man. I have come myself to get the box which he so stupidly left behind. I shall soon take my leave if you will give me the big box. That is all I want.' The lady sparrow at once consented and told her servants to bring out the big box. The old woman eagerly seized it, and hoisted it on her back, and without even stopping to thank the lady sparrow, began to hurry homewards. The box was so heavy that she could not walk fast, much less run, as she would have liked to do. So anxious was she to get home and see what was inside the box, but she had often to sit down and rest herself by the way. While she was staggering along under the heavy load, her desire to open the box became too great to be resisted. She could wait no longer, for she supposed this big box to be full of gold and silver and precious jewels like the small one her husband had received. At last this greedy and selfish old woman put down the box by the wayside and opened it carefully expecting to gloat her eyes on a mine of wealth. What she saw, however, so terrified her that she nearly lost her senses. As soon as she lifted the lid, a number of horrible and frightful-looking demons bounced out of the box and surrounded her as if they intended to kill her. Not even in nightmares had she ever seen such horrible creatures as her much-coveted box contained. A demon with one huge eye right in the middle of its forehead came and glared at her. Monsters with gaping mouths looked as if they would devour her. A huge snake coiled and hissed about her, and a big frog hopped and croaked towards her. The old woman had never been so frightened in her life, and ran from the spot as fast as her quaking legs would carry her, 
glad to escape alive. When she reached home, she fell to the floor and told her husband with tears all that had happened to her, and how she had been nearly killed by the demons in the box. Then she began to blame the sparrow, but the old man stopped her at once, saying, "'Don't blame the sparrow. It is your wickedness which has at last met with its reward. I only hope this may be a lesson to you in the future.' The old woman said nothing more, and from that day she repented of her cross and kind ways, and by degrees became a good old woman, so that her husband hardly knew her to be the same person, and they spent their last days together happily, free from want or care, spending carefully the treasure the old man had received from his pet, the tongue cut sparrow. End of chapter 2 Recording by Winna Hathaway in Fayetteville, North Carolina.